we felt it would give us the best access to the strongest possible group of senior insurance decision makers. InsureTech Insights is a must-do conference, I think, for the, for the network that is built here. So, uh, how incumbents are shifting roles with health engagement, engagement platforms? There's quite a lot to unpick in all of that, isn't there? Um, you know, what, what is the definition of value? Um, how are they working? How are they not working? And it implies a change as well. And, and all for something that's become a bit of a stalwart for health and wellness related propositions, which have uh, come, become pretty ubiquitous. But surely it's got to be more than just free coffees and cinema tickets, right? Hopefully, right? Is, is there Let's a... Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all hope so for our own sake. And my BMI is testament to that, the need for those. Um, so yeah, why don't, why don't I be quiet and maybe we do some introductions and uh, tomorrow, maybe if you could, you could kick, us, kick us off, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hi everyone, my name is Tamara Page. I'm responsible for prevention solutions and services for Generali in Germany. I think most of you would know Generali Group, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. Um, my team creates and runs uh, services and solutions to foster prevention, to motivate people to live a healthier and a more sustainable life. Life. We do this for all lines of businesses, but with a clear focus on wellness and health. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today with my three colleagues, and thanks for having me. Great stuff. Lisa, please. Yeah, hi everyone. Pleasure to be here with you all, and great to be sharing the stage with my fellow panelists. So I'm head of our Life and Health Digital Business Accelerator at <laughs> Hanover Re. So we work with our insurance clients to embed digital solutions to create new innovative insurance products and propositions. And we're seeing some really exciting developments in the health tech space. We've also heard quite a lot how AI is on the cusp of improving engagement with customers, enabling greater personalization. So really excited to explore with the fellow panelists and all of you how some of this new development might take us forward when it comes to health engagement solutions. Fantastic. Another Matt. Matt, please. <laughs> uh, yep, hello everyone. My name's Matt Battersby, Chief Behavioural Scientist at RGA, the Reinsurance Group of America. <clears throat> RGA focuses on life and health related uh, insurance. So my role in RGA is to help people make better health and wealth decisions by bringing a more scientific understanding of human behaviour across the value chain. So how do we get people to understand and want insurance products? How do we get them to be honest and accurate when they apply for insurance? How do we get them to stay fit and healthy once they have it? And then claims process as well. I think most simply I would say my role is to help our clients, insurers, to create products, policies, communications based on how people really do think and behave rather than how we might wish them to think and behave. And I'm very excited to be on the panel with everyone today and to share our thoughts. Great, Seth. Last but not least, Peter. Yeah, my name is Peter Animus. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Dakadu. We are a Swiss company that are building a, a B2B lifestyle and health scoring platform. We started out 13 years ago. Today we are the platform for 35 of the top 100 insurance operators globally. So United Healthcare Group, Aon, Prudential, Manulife, etc. Our aim is not so much just to say we're going to give you a free cinema ticket or a, a coffee, but we really want to try to help people find their health potential. So we work with a, since 13 years, AI based, that we first create a baseline of health, which is the health score, and then we try to figure out who are you, and then we try to help you understand your life. So in my case, I sleep too little because I run a global company and I wait a little bit too much. So basically, very soon, the system will then try to get me move a little bit more, maybe go a bit earlier to bed, etc. So it's really about understanding your life, and you are not somebody else. We are all individuals, and our health, in my eyes, is the single largest asset we get when we get born. Wonderful. Well, there's a good backdrop. We've got a, a group of people seeing the change, being the change uh, in this area. So why don't we get into it and, um, and kick off? So look, why don't we start at, the, start at the top? And Lisa, maybe this is one for, um, one for you. And do these engagement platforms have an, offer any value? And if so, 
how would you define it? Yeah, there's lots of value to be created with these platforms. And over the past decade or so, we've really seen insurers embracing these platforms and using them to support their customers. So it can add value both on the insurance side and also on the, the customer side. So in terms of the insurance value, some of the big sources we've seen are on the new business side. So really helping to attract new, healthier lives onto the product. So if an insurer gets it right here, they might even see a 10% uplift in new business, even if they're a traditional, well-established incumbent player. And then the real value of these engagement platforms is actually finding a way not just to sell insurance and then someone doesn't interact with the policy until point of claim, but actually creating value for that customer all the way through that policy lifetime. So that creates value for the customer to help them improve their health, and I'm sure Peter will go into some of the, the health improvements they've seen. But then for the insurer's side, it can also improve the persistency on the policy. So particularly at early durations, there can be really high lapses. So actually by engaging customers, it can retain customers, and not just retaining customers, but retaining the most health-conscious customers. So it can really improve that risk profile of the book when it comes to the insurer as well. And all of that uh, not only helps support the customer's health through engaging in these platforms, but like you say, insurers are keen and hungry to share some of that value back with the customers, whether that's premium discounts, free coffee, or perhaps even more relevant health-related rewards as well. Awesome. So we're starting off with a, with a nice, the happy place, you know, the positivity. What else? I know, Tamara, you've got some, some yeah, thoughts and some I examples. I want to echo on, on specifically one point that Lisa just mentioned. Um, I think as an insurance, you're used to talk about claims, about things that can happen to you, about risks, about negative things. Um, those platforms have really enabled us to turn around the conversation to a more positive one, where you actually try to, to prevent something from even happening and you even reward people to going that further step. Um, even though that might feel a bit um, unnatural for an insurance company at the beginning, it really gives you an opportunity to create a more positive impact and a more positive relationship with your client long term. So I do really agree with that point, and I, I think we're only at the beginning of really uh, tackling this point from a communication and marketing perspective. Wonderful. Matt, we're talking about customers here. I think this is the point at which we introduce you and your team and uh, the work that you're doing and ask for some thoughts. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with what's been said, but I also have a caveat to what's been said, I think. So I think what, what I agree is... Um, RGA ran a survey, global survey with clients about 18 months ago when we asked them about sort of commitment to wellness and wellness programs. I think about 75% of clients globally said they have wellness programs or are about to launch one and see it as a priority. So insurers clearly see it as having value and adding value. And I think one of the attractions is, as you were saying, all these ways it can add value. So can it uh, increase sales, ideally risk selection, attracting healthier lives? Is it good for engagement? Can we use it for cross-selling? Can we use it for dynamic pricing, dynamic underwriting? Can it also change health behaviors to improve mortality and everything? These are all great potential areas of value. My caveat, I think, is that sometimes there is a wish or hope that a wellness program would deliver all of those things equally. And from a kind of behavioural science point of view, there is always a challenge. If you design for everything, you design for nothing. If you design for everyone, you design for no one. Sure. Uh, and so I think um, when we look at value, we always look, okay, well, what's your priority of value? You know, what's the most important thing to you? Is it risk selection? Is it health behaviour change? Sometimes they contradict each other slightly. So it's really understanding what that value is. Okay. Well, we scratch away at that. Well, we started to scratch away at a fairly... Uh complex part of the part of the conversation but before we get there peter i mean you're at the from yeah. from switching from a kind of an insurance focus to someone running a a, a global business specializing in this stuff what are you seeing and yeah what constitutes that i when we started out with dakadu we we went after the life and health insurance companies and we didn't actually intentionally you know went after them but it kind of happened and what I want to get at is we've seen the market change very dramatically over the last 10 years. So number one, every American flips their health insurance every 18 months. So there is zero meaning of doing a wellness program if people flip. 
So this was for me one of the first key, I would say, learnings, and we did discuss before, it's bloody hard to change people's behavior. If you every morning are drinking a double coffee with, uh, you know, six, uh, you know, spoons of sugar. Have you been in my house? <laughs> <laughs> this is awkward. So I don't think one size fits all is just going to work overnight. So what we are trying to do, and I'm saying trying, is to build an ecosystem where everybody, where everybody wins. So what we have seen is now the banking world is coming in. So HSBC licensed our platform. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to show hashtag we care. So I think health is becoming such an important part of our life. And when I grew up, I grew up in Denmark in the, in the you know, 70s. It was all fast burgers and you know, hamburgers and, and red hot dogs and so on. And when I listen to my kids today, they want to live different. And I don't think the insurance world has really captured what has changed from the consumer perspective. They are mobile, they are more aware. And so I, I think this engagement, and that was why I mentioned yeah. a, a, an HSBC, they really try to address this next generation of consumers. Okay, so we've got value expressed in a, in a number of different ways, but also we're starting to move into, okay, some of the challenges or the gotchas, because there's, there's always you know, stuff that goes well, stuff that doesn't. Um, what are the problems with the current generation of them, if I can kind of characterize it like that? And tomorrow I know that you had a, a, a view on that. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, a couple of things have been said already by, by Matt and Peter, but um, I think there is a lot that can be said about the growing pains of this business. Yeah. Um, but I want to highlight three points. Um, the first one would be uh, the, the target group and how we, we can address uh, more people. The second is around personalization, uh, and the third one would be technology. So. Initially, I think it's quite easy to attract the people who are already living the healthy lifestyle that we want to foster, right? We, we successfully got those 10% of super fit people who already uh, jog every day, who eat healthy, and who just enjoy being rewarded for it. Um, and to a certain extent, that's a wanted effect, right? You want, as, a, as an insurance company, you want to have those people in your portfolio, especially in protection and health. Um, but uh, it gets quite unhealthy quickly if you only compete for this small piece of target group. So um, to unlock the the value that those platforms can actually have, you would have to, tr to foster real behavior change with those clients who really don't have a healthy lifestyle, who struggle to, uh, to get up in the morning to go for a run. Um, and that's difficult, it takes time, it's a communication issue at the very beginning. It's tough to address someone who's obviously struggling with, with his health to say, well, this could be a solution for you, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. That's not that easy to do from a distribution perspective, um, but it's also a matter of how much do I actually address your personal needs and your triggers. My personal activities that I would like to engage in and also my struggles are very different probably from each and every in those in this room, right? Um, yet most of the platforms currently just provide a one-fits-all solution. We all get the same recommendations, the same activities, same level of reward, um, and that becomes quite frustrating very quickly. So um, there has to be more dynamic and more um, evolution of the value proposition that we can provide and a more personal approach to this. And this leads me to the last point. Um, I think it's fair to say that the insurance industry is not necessarily uh, the front runner when it comes to tax savviness. So, um, That's outrageous. <laughs> um, to, uh, to create that dynamic approach and to be in line with the expectation of the client, you would have to also make this work from a technology perspective. Yet a lot of companies still opt for in-house solutions. They try to connect pieces that they have in their legacy systems, and that just is slow. You can't really adopt to a need quickly. Um, and it's not in line with the expectation of a client that would actually see you more as a competitor to Google Fit, to fitness apps, to shopping apps, rather than 
an insurance app, right? That's not what, what we are competing against. So I think uh, clever partnerships and more collaboration outside to get that technology right is uh, really important for, for the next step. Thank you. And Lisa, any, anything to add to, to that from yours? Yeah, I totally agree with, with Tamara on the impact point, right? So up till now, a lot of the focus has been on let's maximize utilization and adoption of these platforms. You know, can we get 90% of customers using these, these platforms? That, that might be unrealistic. So health tech is becoming a lot more specialized. So maybe you could have a lot more impact if you could get the mental health engagement solution into the hands of those customers that need it most or the physiotherapy health tech solution into those customers with the, the back pain. So I think we maybe need a, a paradigm shift. Maybe we need to think, how can we maximize impact for the end customer, work out what those cohorts are, and then really try to get that right health tech solution into the hands of, of those customers. And of course, there could be an overall layer that, that can try to triage that to the customer, going back to the, the personalization point that we've mentioned. But the key is to maybe think, let's not just get 90% of people using this platform. Let's see who can we target to really have the, the most impact. So targeting someone who goes from 3,000 steps to 4,000 steps a day, that could even have a much bigger impact on the mortality profile of the book than targeting someone who walks 9,000 steps a day to go 10,000 steps a day. So I think it's an exciting time with the health tech that's out there to really be a lot more targeted in terms of the impact that we can have across the portfolio. Cool. So it sounds like, uh, it sounds like things are maturing is my kind of read on, on that. But what about from a customer perspective, Matt? Well, do customers care? Are they... Uh, <coughs> Ambivalent at best? Are they shopping around? You know, so they say they care. Which is <laughs> well, not always the same quite. thing. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are kind of three behavioural challenges we always see with kind of wellness solutions. So the first one is uptake. Can you just get people to um, take on the wellness solution? And the challenge is that there are a lot out there at the moment. So it's quite a competitive marketplace. I, I had a look, and apparently there's 400,000 wellness apps available on app stores now. I haven't count, counted them. So <laughs> yeah. What sure. a night you had last night. Yeah. I was going to say, have you tested them all? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, and most of those just are hardly downloaded, you know, a few thousand kind of uh, downloads at most. But so if, say you do get someone to, to take up your, your program, there's then engagement, and you see a lot of these, even if they're downloaded or kind of signed up for, Engagement falls pretty rapidly, it might be after, even sometimes just after a week or two. But obviously, the biggest challenge then is the health behavior change one, as you said earlier. Health behavior change is really hard. Um, we all say that we want to be healthier, eat better, exercise more, but our behaviors don't often live that out. Um, and sometimes the problem is you base propositions on market research to say, oh, people say they want to get fit, they just need a bit more information or a bit of an incentive and they'll do it. But what you're hearing from people there is their kind of idealized version of themselves. Yeah. It's like, of course I want to eat a salad next week. I'll have the burger today, but I'll, you know, I'll eat the salad next week. And so you design your proposition based on that idealized version that we might have, but also they might have of their behavior. Um, and that's why you have to actually build in a genuine understanding, not just what your customers tell you sometimes about what they need. Great stuff. And again, from the cold face, Peter. Yeah, so I, I think the insurance industry is sick, and I, I really mean it the way that I say it, because basically we run the business on life tables that was invented 175 years ago. So Gomet was a British mathematician. He sat down in 1824 and he said, you will have an accident, you will get ill, and you will die. I know it's not very romantic, but basically what he was calculating was the distance to disaster. Mm. And I think in a world where we have so much data, we can predict and prevent in a lot more powerful way. So I want to keep you healthy as long as possible. And I know there was a very famous Harvard book called Lifespan, and I actually think it's a very wrong title because I don't want to be 200 years old, sit in a wheelchair, be blind, and have lost two eggs because of diabetes. And I'm extra provoking sure. just to explain, I'd rather be 90 and have had a great life. And what I'm getting at is I believe health span should be the focus of any insurance company. 
And that brings me to the key point I, I spent going around the world, as you know, all the time. I was just in America, 67% of all Americans cannot afford their health insurance next year. This is their number thought, number one, and you will see the election. On Swiss national TV, Thursday evening, prime news, 47% of all Swiss are deeply concerned about their health insurance. So I think the insurance industry, and that's why I'm saying it's sick, I mean, it's my clients, are living on borrowed time. Because the model we built about solidarity principle and eat all you want, 595, is not going to survive in an economy where information, machine learning, and so I think insurance is at its end of life cycle, yep. and they haven't woken up to that yet. Okay. Wow, how do you follow that? Well, let's, um, let's, let's start looking to the future maybe, let's switch a bit. Um, how, do we, how do we make these better? Could you set the context of, look, there's value there, consumer expectations have moved on, the market needs to move on, uh, how do we make things better? And Matt, I think maybe you, uh, maybe from you first. Yeah, I mean, so obviously I think we need more behavioral science embedded into all these <laughs> solutions. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, let me give an example of um, an interesting kind of behavioral um, intervention in the last couple of years. I'm using interesting in the, in the British. Kind yeah, of, this yeah, is yeah, a safe space where in sure tech insights. Yeah, so, so. Um, okay. so in, in, in England, um, people who are uh, from here will know that in the last couple of years, restaurants above a certain size have to put calorie counts next to um, items on menus. I think some European countries do the same. Idea that came from the US uh, originally. And the idea behind that is, of course people want to eat healthily, they're just lacking the information. If I give them the information at the point they're making a decision about what dish to eat, they'll eat healthier, right? Um, sadly, the evidence doesn't quite back that out. Some evidence it has that positive benefit. Most evidence that it's kind of neutral, but also some evidence that it backfires. Actually showing people their calorie count, people make worse decisions about healthy food. And the reason for that is because we sometimes misunderstand what someone's goal is when they go into a restaurant. Your goal is probably not to eat the healthiest thing on the menu. Your goal is what's the tastiest thing and what's the best value thing. And if there's two burgers and one's got double the calories for the same price, you probably think that's going to be tastier and that's going to be you know, better value. And what I think that is an example of is misunderstanding what people's true goals are. We think we, their goal must be to be, be healthy. That's the rational goal. Actually, often we see in health behavior change, people have, you look at smoking or alcohol campaigns, so much research shows that it's easier to encourage someone to reduce alcohol or smoking by appealing to the impact it has on their appearance, saggy skin, premature aging, that, than it does on long-term bowel cancer, health and things like that. So I think where, where we've seen the most successful kind of wellness proposition stuff going now, it's really understanding, okay, let's build for the true customer here, rather than the actuarial assumption about what a customer is and how they should think and behave. Let's design to that true person. That's why I see the exciting stuff at the moment. Great. Any other, any other thoughts from, uh, from you all who'd like to feel that? Lisa, please. Yeah, I think, I think it's a, a great, exciting area, right? So to build on the preventative healthcare and really appealing to, to customers on their health. We did an internal pilot with a company, Gene Planet. So it's all about combining lifestyle and health genetic insights together with blood data, wearables data, all these different types of data that are out there to really empower people to, to take that ownership uh, on their health. So in my case, in the pilot, I found out I was at high genetic risk for cardiovascular disease. And I mean, that on its own, it maybe isn't worrying. I'm quite young, you know, statistically, those old life tables that you were talking about, Peter would say, you know, unlikely to die from, from a heart attack. But what I could see from the blood test results was that I had high cholesterol as well. So that then made me, made me worried, right? That's starting to increase the, the cardiovascular risk for, for me. So as a result of that, I was actually coached to take action and reduce the amount of high fat food. So giving up those lovely things like cheese and, and chocolate that I love a lot. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, to your point, Matt, I, I did cut those out for, for a couple of months, right? I completely cut out chocolate and cheese. I did another blood test and then my cholesterol came back within normal range. So that did give me the proof that, you know, making that lifestyle change can improve my health. And then from there, it's more about that balance and moderation, right? So just eating a bit less of the, the cheese and chocolate than I was before to, to navigate that risk. So 
those are the sort of more personalized insights when you start to bring together some of the medical science technology, some of the behavioral angles, some of the health data that's out there. You could really start to get people to engage in more of a preventative healthcare approach so that they can really live healthier for longer. Fantastic. We've got a question from the audience, it probably ties in at this point, but have any of these platforms delivered on tangible health outcomes? I think a, we've got an example here of uh, you know, a, an effect. And Tamara, I know you'd mentioned some of the uh, some pilots or POCs that you've been running as well. I know also there's some secret squirrel stuff that maybe can't disclose all of it, but maybe yeah. some, some highlights perhaps? A couple of highlights I think we can share. So, um, first of all, I want to say uh, I think it really takes some patience. Um, uh, Matt said it at the very beginning. Um, with with those platforms in the early stages, um, we thought we can do it all at the same time, and results will will just uh, be there at at day one. Um, but some aspects really take some time to be digested and to materialize in in value and in the business. Um, but we can see early positive results uh, when it comes to lapse rates, so people are more likely to stay with your policy, especially in protection, um, if it's combined and in, with an engaged client combined in, in, a, in a platform. We can also see that, um, but you really have to get it right, and this really takes a lot of iterations to, to find the right recipe, um, that with the right motivation, you can actually get unengaged target groups to do something, to do small steps. And as Lisa said, um, for a bigger portfolio that has a bigger impact than uh, encouraging someone who runs 20 kilometers a day every day to do 21. Um, I do think that uh, we, we have to focus on the right, on the right strategy. It's not something that uh, can be done from one day to the other. And you really have to get it right and you have to get it uh, perfect. So I would say less is more. Focus on, on smaller actions and on those activities that you feel as in your business are really important to you and try to get the motivations and the triggers right for those ones. Thank you. Peter, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, you know, people always say that the digital health lacks uh, outcome and, and I think that's the biggest, you know, the no-sayers that yeah. don't want the change. And, um, you know, we will publish a paper, not Dakadu, but somebody in Europe um, that was using Dakadu for a period over five years and they would actually, it's an academic paper, it's fully audited, um, that and it has nothing to do with Dakadu at the end of the day, it has to do with that if you can integrate the lifestyle of a you know, health insurance client, that we lower the cost for every single client, and that significantly. And my second point, which I think also puts a lot of the discussion to rest, Capgemini, and I have no shares, no commission, nothing, <laughs> they published, if you haven't read it, uh, the Global Wellness Report. And they interviewed, I can't remember, 32,000 people, I think it was. And they came to the conclusion and said that 69% of all consumers would like to have a well-being platform that follows them. And 6% of the CEOs that were also interviewed, I think they are tearing down our building, um, they said, 6% said, we have an appealing well-being offering. And just to wrap it up, and then I promise to stay quiet, the, if you look at the accelerator underwriting, we heard from Allianz earlier today, you saw yes. 7% just by dynamic underwriting, yeah. so you take 7% out. If you then start thinking about the flipping of insurances, as I said, with the 18 months, you start building something which becomes super powerful. And with McKinsey, they publish that if you have an engagement platform, you can take out 25% of the cost of your operational insurance. So I'm not saying they're wrong or right. I'm just saying sure. the people today that says there is no data, it's absolutely not true. Yeah, it seems to me there's no shortage of data out there. We talked about this in you know, discussions ahead of this. It's how, can you, how can you use it and leverage some value from it? Okay. Um, Peter, we're going we're gonna to wrap up with you with a final question that we've, we've talked about. So we've talked about the pros, we've talked about the cons, we've talked about you know, uh, how we make things better, but what, do, what does the future look like from your perspective? Yeah, that's one of my favorite topics, and as a legal disclaimer, I'm 59 years old, 
and it's my fifth company, and I love doing what I'm doing, I believe all of us will have to work longer. And I participated last week in the European Healthy Aging uh, Conference, and they said that six, you know, 35% uh, of all people would be over 60 years of age in Europe over the next 10 years. So basically we have to ensure a group that we have to look after. If we don't, if you think today you wait long 12 months at the NSH, imagine if we don't. So all the baby boomers are coming past the 60s and in now. So I believe the future is gonna look at three core things. Number one, healthy aging. I believe it's gonna be one of the fastest and most significant growth market for life and health insurance companies. Number two, ensuring the insurable, because if I understand your lifestyle, I can price your lifestyle. And number three, I think, and this is provocative, I, I do believe over the next 10 years, we will conquer diseases such as cancer, but we can only do it with data. And I really believe in Europe, we need to start taking data a lot more serious, have the right laws, but now, there's coming the data sharing for digital sure. health across Europe, and that's going to bring health you would never have thought about before. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've probably got time, guys, for uh, um, a couple more comments on that, and we'll go to a couple of questions. But yeah, any any other thoughts about what the future looks like? Is it, you know, do you share Peter's view? Have we got any contradictions, or yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think there might be a growing role for more passive health engagement platforms. That's quite controversial, but, but to the points that we've raised here, you know, maybe people don't want to be logging into these, these apps every single day. There's the tech out there, you mentioned people with, with chronic diseases, where maybe that health engagement platform simply alerts someone if they might be at, at risk of a particular disease. So we see things like sleep apnea flagging in the pipeline. So maybe that insurer is there and they're that person's life partner that if they are at risk of having sleep apnea and they don't know about it, it pushes that alert, maybe sends them to that sleep clinician so they get treated. Uh, could be similar in the case of, of cancer marker detections as well. So almost trying to balance that proactive engagement alongside recognizing that maybe people don't want to engage uh, constantly with these apps, but they might value having that insurer there in terms of the, the peace of mind to know if they have a particular chronic disease that's developing, they will get an alert and then they can go and get the treatment for that before it becomes more severe so they can live healthier for longer. So more deeply integrated into just everyday life, is that what the future? Yeah, more deeply integrated in terms of the healthcare system intersecting with insurers so insurers can really be that, that healthcare partner for people rather than you know that sort of wellness uh, partner, they can really make sure, sure to, to use some of this technology to help flag diseases sooner than they otherwise would have been aware of and help them get treatment for that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got three and a bit minutes left. Have we got any other thoughts before we move on to some, on some questions? I uh, would like to build on what Lisa just said. So um, I think there is a gap between the wellness piece and the, the very prevention-driven positive aspect of, of engaging people who are still healthy. And there is a lot available in terms of services for chronic, uh, for chronic conditions, for health management. Um, but there is very little to connect those two worlds and to make sure that people really uh, catch something before it gets really bad. We see very low traffic in those health services as good as they might be and, and they do what they intend to do if the person is actually following through with it, but the dots are not necessarily connected. So I do believe there is a lot of power and a lot of value that sits in there and it pays into Peter's point of living, not just living longer, but living healthier because you actually uh, utilize all of the tools that you have at hand. Fantastic. Thank you. Matt, are you... Uh I'll just say one thing. Well, I'm, last words. I'm yeah. always interested yeah. in how you keep these things relevant in a competitive kind of marketplace. One of the things I'm interested in is where there's an opportunity to link programs that improve personal health with programs that improve planetary health as well. Yep. So there are a lot of behaviours which are good for you personally, but also good for the planet. So reducing your tobacco consumption, alcohol, there's lots of CO2 involved there. Um, and we're increasingly becoming aware of 
the health impacts of climate change and things on people? And are we too focused just on the personal? Yeah. Where we could also be rewarding things that benefit the planet. And to your point about targeting the younger generation, there are lots of people who, are, who care about that and perhaps want to be rewarded as much for that as for the health angle. And the benefit for us is that these also have a health benefit as well, these, these positive climate behaviours. So I think that's an interesting area for the future. A much bigger role. Actually, there's a, there's a question that's come in around um, uh, maybe when we talk about health, it becomes a bit synonymous with physical health, but also do we mean, do we, do we take, well, I'm going to infer from this, a more holistic view of health and wellness to encompass uh, mental health, for example, as well. Certainly from the research we, we see and do, we see financial wellness being a, a key contributor. We talked about sleep apnea and therefore the, uh, uh, the impact of a range of conditions um, impacting health overall. Is that fair to say? Yeah, Peter? I, I can give a statistical data there. So over the last five years, we see uh, that uh, youngsters between 20 and 30, they go 18% more to the doctor than the previous generation. And that is something we shouldn't underestimate. So there's a huge avalanche, and I didn't say that before, but you know, if you look at an HSBC and what you touched on, they really try to help those people in a young age, and then you create sustainable long-term business because you help uh, younger people. So yes, uh, I, I do believe that mental is a core, core issue, unfortunately, with COVID. And sure. um, we see it in, in the bills. We see it in the, the doctor bookings. You know? yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. I think we're at time now.